Good morning, brethren. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are viewing us from, I want to welcome you back again to our school of the word. I'm so blessed to have you tuned in to the seat with us as we go through the study of the Old Testament. Let's just begin by pausing in a word of prayer and asking God for his direction and his leadership. Let's pray. Father, we thank and we bless you this morning. We thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, that your word is true. And Father, as we take time to get into your word and to study, we ask for your insight, your understanding, your knowledge, that Father, this word may become real to us. We may see what you have done through the pages of the written text. In Jesus' mighty name we do pray. Amen. Once again, welcome back to the School of the Word. We've been dealing with an introduction to the Old Testament. We've covered quite a number of uh, topics so far. Last week, we began looking at the people of the Old Testament, and we looked at um, the people that were that Israel found within the land of Canaan when they arrived. We looked at um, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Phoenicians, and the Amorites, the people that were within the land when the children of Israel arrived. Now we said last week the nations and people that surrounded the ancient Israel and Judah helped to shape their origins, their history, and their culture. If you recall, we said last week that most of these neighbors were largely related to biblical Israel, that's basically Jacob. Others were treated as agents to punish Israel, others were there to help rescue Israel in a divine plan that always focuses on Israel, that's Jacob. So they were related. As you saw last week that Genesis 19 introduced us to the Ammonites and the Moabites, the two sons that came out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters. The youngest daughter giving birth to a son she called Ben Ami, who was the father of the Ammonites, and the oldest daughter giving birth to a son she called Moab, who became the father of the Moabites. We also last week that Genesis 36 introduces us to Jacob's brother Esau. And Esau, we are, we are, if you remember very well, was the ancestor of a group we read in the Bible known as the Edomites. So Ammon, Moab, and Edom were all part of Abraham's family through their ancestors, Lot and Esau, and they were related to the original Jacob through their ancestor Abraham, but they are not considered as part of God's chosen people. So from Genesis 9 onwards, we see that relationship unfolding in the scriptures. So we examine the people who were within the border of Israel and Judah. Today we'll proceed further and look at the people who are on the borders. We're just outside the borders of the land of promise. We also say that the others were the occupying empires and those who study at a later stage, in a different, uh, later course. So I would say there are many groups of people who were present in the land of, of Canaan when Israel came to the land. Many were later created to the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And some of them lived on the borders of Israel and Judah. We, know, we saw in a previous course, I'm going to do Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 7, what was going to form the boundary of the land of promise. So we look today, today at two of these people groups. Those were on the borders of Transjordan, and those were on the borders of the Araba and the Negev. If you remember the Transjordan, with all those videos we did of the land of promise, the Araba, the Rift Valley, was also one of those areas we discussed in the previous course. The Negev, we said the land to the south, the wilderness, was another area we discussed in the previous course. 
So let's begin with those way on the borders of Transjordan. Now there are several nomadic neighbors who dwelt on the various borders of Israel and Judah. And many of these had similar origins to Israel and Judah, and they were closely tied to Israel and Judah. In terms of the people on the borders of the Amorite, on the Transjordan, look at three main people groups that are found, that are located on the borders of the Transjordan. We'll discuss the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites. Those are the three people groups that were on the borders of Transjordan. Let's begin with the Ammonites. According to Judges 11.13, the king or the ruler of Ammon complained that the Israelites had occupied the land of the Ammonites. Now the Ammonites settled between the two rivers of Deuteronomy 316, the river Jabok and the river Ammon. Their capital of the Ammonites, the capital of the Ammonites, was a place known as Rabbath Ammon, and that's the location of present-day Ammon in Jordan. Now it's about 40 kilometers east of the Dead Sea. So if you look at the study of scripture, the rightful territory of the Ammonites was actually the area to the eastern part of the Dead Sea. Israel was to occupy the area to the western part, a place the Bible calls Gilead. Now Israel and Ammon have shared origins. They've got kingship ties. They're related, so to say. You remember what we said in the previous um, session? I'm going to Genesis 19. Ammon came out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. The son was born from that relationship was a gentleman known as Ben Ami, and Ben Ami became the father of the Ammonites. So there was that relationship that existed. So they had a cordial relationship between the Israelites and the Ammonites. In fact, look at Samuel chapter 15 to about 2 Samuel chapter 20, we see that when Absalom rebelled against David, Overthrowing David and Absalom taking over authority in the land, David fled. And when he fled from the land, he headed to Ammon. And they welcomed him. When King Solomon ruled the, the United Kingdom, we are told that apart from the worship of God, of Yahweh, King Solomon adopted many other religious cults, such as Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites. We are told that in 1 Samuel 11.5 and 2 Kings 23. What else do we know? The mother of King Rehoboam, the one who succeeded Solomon after Solomon had passed on, we are told the mother of Rehoboam was actually an Ammonite. She was from Ammon. She was an Ammonitess. We also read further in 1 Kings 24, in 2 Kings 24, from verse 1 and 2, that the Ammonites assisted King Nebuchadnezzar when he came to fight against Judah. That was quite a betrayal of their own villages. And later on, if you look at the prophetic books like Jeremiah 27, Ezekiel 21, Zephaniah 2, the, prophet, the prophets were quite resentful of the way the Ammonites had benefited by aiding Nebuchadnezzar against Judah. When Nebuchadnezzar attacked the land, we are told in Jeremiah 40, 11 and 12, that some people fled the Ammonites. 
when after when they attacked Judah, they fled the Ammonites. And later, when they heard that Nebuchadnezzar had set in place a governor, Gedalian, we are told this. People of Judah returned to the land from Ammon. In Ezra 9, we are told that when Ezra found out that some of the leaders had intermarried with the abominations in the land, he sat in ashes, he bowed his head, he was just in total shock. So to say. You read that in Ezra 9, verse 1 and 2. Now, these Amorites, the Ammonites, right? what exactly do we know about them? Where do they come from? And why do we have this relation, this conflict with Israel and with Judah? We saw earlier on in Genesis 19 and verse 38 that the Ammonites descended from Ben Ami. Ben Ami was the son of Lot from the ancestors relationship between Lot and his youngest daughter. You know the story. After Lot and his family left Solomon and Gomorrah, the wife could not forget the wonderful place she had lived in, in spite of God's direct instructions not to look back. She chose to take one last look at Sodom and Gomorrah. We are told from the scriptures, she immediately turned into a pillar of salt. So Lord remained with his two daughters as they fled to the, to the, to the, to the mountains, to the wilderness, to the caves, away from God's judgment. In that period, the daughters realized they had no husbands and their legacy, their identity, their next boys just go down was all of no one to carry it on. So they chose to intoxicate their father, make him drunk, when he could not, he could not even speak anymore, and they each took turns to sleep with their father. The youngest daughter conceived and gave birth to a son, Ben Ami, and Ben Ami is the father of the Ammonites. So Ammonites are actually as indigenous people are actually descendants of Lot. Later on, they grew so strong that they even displaced an ancient people in the land that was known as the Zamzumi, near the headwaters of the Jabbok. We read that story in Deuteronomy chapter 2, 19 to 21. So the Ammonites occupied that area near the Transjordan Plateau before the Israelites arrived. And God strictly told the Israelites not even to dare to occupy the land of the Ammonites as God had given it as an inheritance to the descendants of Lot. That we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 19 and Numbers 24 and verse 24. Numbers 21, verse 24. In Judges 11, the Ammonite king made a plea to Jephthah. He says Israel had taken over his land. But we study that plea and that whole scenario deeper, we begin to realize that that plea was actually not honest at all. The Ammonites had lost the land to Sihon, king of the Amorites. And Sihon, king of the Amorites, had taken over the land. That is found in Deuteronomy 21, no, rather Numbers 21, 21 to 24. When Israel came to the land and sent messengers to Simon asking for passage through the land as they went on their way, Simon told them not in my land and went out to battle with the Israelites. In that battle, Simon lost and Israel occupied the land. Yes, the land was not given to the Ammonites, but they had lost it in battle. So it was not honest for them to say Israel had taken the land from them because they had lost it to the, to the Ammonites. And Israel recaptured that land from the Ammonites. The second group of people we find across the Transjordan were the Moabites. 
In 2 Kings 3, verse 4 and 5, we read, Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. What happened? When Ahab died, that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So, here is another uh, story, another group of people, the Moabites. And several Moabites' territories and settlements are mentioned in the scripture. But what do we see from this scripture? Is that the Moabites' wealth lay in sheep breeding. If the king could be able to pay a hundred thousand lambs and the wood of a hundred thousand rams, it was a very lucrative business for the Moabites. So sheep breeding was one of the best business for the Moabites. Another key position for them was their access to the king's highway. The king's highway ran from Syria to the Red Sea. It's one of those international highways in the ancient areas that still exist, but that's what it was called, the king's highway, and that's where Moab was. So their position on that highway made it possible for them to trade and also to be able to get goods that were not found in their land. But where did more words come from? Genesis 19.37 tells us the story of Lot and his two daughters. After Lot was made drunk in doctrine by his daughters, the oldest daughter of Moab took her turn to sleep with her father and she conceived and she gave to his birth to a son and she called his name Moab. So Moabites are descended from Lot. They are descended from Moab, the son of Lot's daughter, and also descended basically from Lot himself. So the Moabites were the sons of Lot. Deuteronomy 23 verse 3, we are told that just like the Ammonites, though they were descended from Lot, the Moabites were excluded from the congregation of Israel. So they were also not part of the chosen people. In Judges 3, the time of the Judges 3, verse 12 to 30, Israel disobeyed God, and we are told that God allowed the Moabite king, Eglon, to conquer the Jews, the Hebrews. And the Hebrews served Eglon for 18 years. When Israel repented and cried out to God, God provided a, a, a deliverer, Ehud, the left hand man, who broke the yoke of Moab. We also meet the Moabites when they begin to have a relationship with the Midianites in trying to deal with this group of people known as the Israelites in the land. The king of Moab feared the Israelites as they were camping on his borders and he sought Balaam, the prophet of prophet, to curse the Israelites. In 1 Samuel 14, 47 and 2 Samuel 2, 1 to 2, we read in the time of the United Kingdom, when there was Saul and David, Israel continued to rule over Moab. David even obtained tribute from the Moabites. And in 1 Samuel 13, 11, we read that the Moabite women were part of Saul's women, the women that he loved too much, he loved a lot of women. So, we would call him the womanizer. They actually led him astray from God and he ended up building high places for the Moabite God Chemosh at Jerusalem. In 1 Samuel 22, we read the story of David 
When he was um, running away from King Saul, who wanted his life, we had to kill him. We are told that David ran away and settled in the land of Moab. His family came to him, his father and his mother and his brothers, and they all became exiles in the land of Moab. You remember the story, number 22, the story of Balaam, the prophet of prophets. It's all set against the background of the Moabites. The Moabite, Moab king, the Moabite king feared the Israelites and sought Balaam to curse Israel. But the Moabite story does not always end on the negative note. We have a good finish to the Moabite story. The Bible tells about a Moabite heroine who became part of the family of David and in essence became an ancestor to our Lord Jesus Christ through the line of David. That story is told us in one book of the Bible, the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite who later became an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ through the line of David. So it didn't end on a sad note only, but also on a good note. The third people we find on the back, on the borders of Israel and Judah are the Edomites. Edomites were told are descendants of Israel, of Esau, the firstborn of Isaac and the twin brother of Jacob. You know the story. Genesis 25, 23, God gave a prophet to Rebecca that she was expecting twins. And that those twins, Esau and Jacob, were going to become two nations. And those two nations would contend with each other a prophet that became true throughout history. You remember the story? Esau came from the field, tired, hungry. Wanted some soup from Jacob. Jacob traded the soup for the birthright. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of red soup. Later on, when Isaac was dying, Rebekah helped Jacob to deceive Esau out of the blessing of the firstborn. And that brought about a lot of animosity between the two brothers. Esau became the father of the Edomites. Jacob became the father of the Israelites. The, new na the two nations continued to strive with each other just as God had prophesied to Rebekah in Genesis 25. It's only two. Verse 5. We are told that when Israel was coming into the land, after the Exodus, after the, their stay in Egypt, as slaves, when they came out, Deuteronomy 2, chapter 2, verse 5, they were not to meddle with Mount Sinai because God had given that land to Esau as a possession. So the Judges 20, Joshua 24, verse 4, Isaiah 63, verse 1, 2 Kings 14, we are introduced to places like Mount Sinai, Bozrah, and Selah. All these are references to places in the land of Edom. Today, Selah is best known as Petra, a wonderful place in the Middle East. I want to tell 36, verse 31. Edomites already had kings reigning over them long before Israel had a king. The first king of Israel only came during the time of Samuel when Israel demanded a king like the other nations. When Israel was coming to the land of Canaan to possess it, they passed through the king's highway, and this king's highway also passed through the land of Edom. And when they came to the land of Edom, they asked for safe passage. And the scripture tells us the 
Edomites refused the Israelites safe passage. And because they were blood of brothers, the Israelites decided to turn around and use a different route. But we know about the Edomites and the Israelites in Scripture. Acts um, Amos 1.11 calls the relationship between Edom and Israel a covenant of brothers. In Deuteronomy 23 verse 7 we are told God strictly, strictly forbid Israel to hate the Edomites because they were relatives. Though the Edomites regularly attacked the Israelites, the Israelites were not supposed, were not supposed to hate the Edomites. Because, as Amos says, it was a covenant of brothers. So the three people groups we cover today, the Ammonites in this session, the Moabites and the Edomites are directly descended from Abraham and they are related to Jacob. Yet, they are not part of the children of promise. The Edomites continued. There's a period of history in Israel known as the Hasmonean dynasty. During the Hasmonean dynasty, when the Maccabeans and Hasmoneans were ruling in the land, the Hasmonean ruler forcibly, forcibly converted the Edomites to Judaism. Though they are converted to Judaism, they are continued the hatred for the Jews. In the New Testament, introduced to a group of people known as the Edomians. The Edomians are just basically the Edomites of the Old Testament. Edomia is just a Greek version of the name Edom. Edomites. One of the most notable Edomians or Edomites known in history was King Herod the Great, the man that butchered small boys in Matthew 2 in an attempt to destroy Christ after the Magi had come to him. Now we are, we are, we are always told during Christmas that it's the three wise men. If you read scripture, you discover that when they came into the land, into the area, the whole place was shaken. So I don't think there were three. It must have been an entourage. So there was this animosity that existed between the Edomites and the Israelites. In Ezekiel 35, verse 15, God gives a prophecy to the Edomites through Ezekiel. It reads, you rejoiced at the destruction of Israel's territory. Now I will rejoice at yours. You will be wiped out, you people of Mount Sire, and all who live in Edom. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That's the New Living Translation. After Herod's death, the Edomians, the Edomites, slowly disappeared from history in fulfillment of God's prophecy in Ezekiel 35. Despite Edom's constant efforts to rule over the Jews, God's prophecy to Rebekah in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, was fulfilled. The older child, Esau, Edom, served the younger, Jacob or Israel. So these three are the ones that are found on the border of the Transjordan. Now let's look at those who are found on the borders of the Araba and the Negev. Various other people groups inhabited the territory of the south and east of Palestine or Canaan. From the Arabian Sea across the Rift Valley, the Araba, south of the Dead Sea and to the south area, the wilderness, the land of the Negev. In this, we look at just two of these groups, the Malekites 
The Malachites were a formidable tribe of nomads living in the south of Canaan. They live between Mount Sinai and the Egyptian border. According to Genesis 36, we can trace the Amalekites back to Edom. They were related to the Edomites, but were still distinct from the Edomites. What's the relationship between the Amalekites and the Israelites? Exodus 17, from verse 8 to verse 14. Scripture records the long lasting feud that existed between the Amalekites and the Israelites, and God's direction to Israel to wipe the Amalekites off the face of the earth. When did it all start? When did this feud begin? Numbers 14. Is one of the occasions where this feud is seen. The Amalekites joined the Canaanites in attacking Israel at a place known as Homer. But it all begins in Exodus 17. Exodus 17. That's where it all begins. Where God gives that instruction for them to wipe them out. And the Amalekites continue to join other tribes to attack Israel. In Judges 3, they joined the Moabites to attack Israel. In Judges 6, they joined the Midianites to attack Israel and destroy the produce of the land. Every time Israel would plant their crops, the Amalekites and the Midianites would arrive, scatter the people, destroy the produce. So there was nothing left for human being or for animal. You did not have to starve the people to death. That's how bitter and that's how many Muslims have been the Amalekites and the Israelites. 1 Samuel 15, we are told that God told King Saul to completely destroy everything concerning the Amalekites. Saul sent a warning message to the Canaanites who were friends of Israel to leave the area before he launched the attack. So attacked the Amalekites, but did not complete the task. He allows King Agag to leave. He takes some spoils of war, some nice cattle, some nice things for himself and his men. When confronted by Saul, by Samuel, he says he put them aside so he can sacrifice them to God. And Samuel says, Is God more interested in sacrifice than in obedience? And Samuel says, To or disobey is like the sin of witchcraft. This disobedience of Saul later affects the Israelites. And they continued harassing the Israelites. 1 Samuel 30 tells us that Israel, the Amalekites attacked the village of Ziklag in Judea, and that village David had some property. They burnt the village to the ground and they took the women and the children captive. Among those captives were David's two wives. David and his men pursued the Amalekites, defeated them and rescued the captives. Unfortunately, some of the Amalekites escaped. In 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 42 to 43, we are told that during the reign of King Hezekiah, the Simeonites killed the remaining Amalekites. Esther 9. The last mention of the Amalekites is in the book of Esther. You know the story. Haman the Agagite and Mordecai, a descendant of Benjamin, in Persia, far from home. Haman was a descendant of King Agag, 
was paired by King Saul and Mordecai was a descendant of the Benjamites and King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Haman the Agagite plotted the annihilation of the Jewish people in Persia using, falsely using an order by King Xerxes. Through Queen Esther, God saved the Jews. Haman, his sons, and the rest of the enemies of Israel were destroyed. The last group we look at this morning are the Midianites. Many of us know Abraham as the father of Ishmael through Hagar and also as the father of Isaac through Sarah. But did you know that after Sarah died, Abraham had another wife, her name was Keturah. And Keturah had six sons. One of those sons was called Midian. And Midian became the, the, the ancestor of the Midianites. So the Midianites are children of Abram as well. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. After Moses tried to help God in Egypt, he was exposed. He ran away from Egypt. He settled in the land of Midian. In Midian, he married Zipporah and he served his father in law, Jephro, as a shepherd for 40 years. We are told Jephro was a priest of Midian. An indication of the Midianites, at least during the time of Moses, still retained the knowledge of God, of the God of their father, Abraham. When Moses receives his call to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, he is in Midian. I go to Exodus 3 and 4. When they leave the land of Egypt and they are going to the promised land, Moses makes use of Hobab, his Midianite brother-in-law, an expert on traveling in the desert and the wilderness as a guide as a traveler during the Exodus. You find that in Numbers 10, 29 to 33. What's the relationship between Israel and the Midianites? Numbers 22 verse 7 tells us, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. So the Moabites and the Midianites got together, afraid of the Israelites, and went to Balaam to go and seek his intervention. So the relationship between the Israelites and the Moabites began to sour when the Midianites joined forces with the Moabites to hire Balaam the prophet, the prophet of prophet, to curse the Israelites. Later, Israel fell into idolatry and sexual sin with Moabite women, and God's judgment came upon Israel. We are told an Israelite went and took himself a Moabite woman and came with her into the Israelite, Israelite camp while they were weeping over their sin. And he went with this woman with no fear of God or fear of reprisals into his tent. Number 25 says in verse 7 and 8 When Phineas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. It's only when Phineas acted that God's plague was stopped. Because the plague had come because of their idolatry and idolatry. Numbers 25, 17 and 18, Moses told the Israelites 
to wage war against the Midianites. Israelites did eventually attack the Midianites, meeting out divine retribution against their enemies. We are told in Numbers 31 verse 8, the five kings of the Midianites were killed as well as Balaam, the prophet of prophets. And this last battle, this battle between Israelites and the Midianites where Balaam was killed, was the last thing that Moses accomplished as leader of the Israelites. We read earlier on in Judges 6, that during the time of the Judges, the Midianites, you know, the Malachites, and other Eastern people used to invert the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the land of promise, and destroy the farm produce. But God had to raise up Jod, Gideon as a judge with the army of 300 Gideon overcame the Midianites. So what are we saying? The people groups that related with Israel, four of them were in the land when Israel came to the land. The Philistines, Phoenicians, the Ammonites, and the Philistines. Four in the land. The Canaanites, the Philistines, the Phoenicians, and the Amorites were in the land. And these other five groups of people were on the borders of Israel. The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Malachites, and the Midianites. They were all on the border of Israel. So these people all had an effect on the land of Israel. Thank you for attending our class this morning. We'll see you again in the next class. Have any questions or comments, please post them in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook. Consider subscribing to this channel and click the like button and also share the video.